Hello, I'm Saifuddin Amos. Welcome to the Bitcoin Standard Podcast, bringing you seminars from saifuddin.com, my online learning and publishing platform, where you can be the first to read my work and take my online courses on Bitcoin and Austrian economics. Members can read the draft of my next book, The Fiat Standard, in full, and also receive chapters from my forthcoming textbook, Principles of Economics, as they are written. By joining saifuddin.com, you can also join our regular seminars, which you hear on this podcast. The Bitcoin Standard Podcast is brought to you by BitMEX Spot, the brand new spot exchange from BitMEX. You've probably heard of BitMEX, one of the oldest large Bitcoin companies who played a leading role in helping Bitcoin emerge victorious from the hard fork wars of 2017. Their derivatives trading platform has stood the test of time and set the standard for reliability and performance for Bitcoin companies. BitMEX is now bringing that reliability to its spot exchange and it is celebrating the launch of BitMEX Spot with a total of $1 million in prizes and a first prize of half a million dollars. Sign up on bitmex.com slash to begin buying Bitcoin and get a chance of winning. Coinbits. Coinbits is a great way to introduce your pre-coin or friends and family to Bitcoin. Get them set up in under a minute and help kickstart their journey by turning everyday spare change into Bitcoin. This Bitcoin-only app takes the uncertainty and fear out of Bitcoin saving by rounding up debit and credit card purchases to the nearest dollar, then using the difference to buy Bitcoin. Set it, forget it, and let the app automatically tax your high-time preference spending by saving the hardest money ever. Want to save in Bitcoin faster? Customers can multiply their roundups up to 10x or adjust their savings frequency for weekly or daily Bitcoin stacking. Coinbits is built on a sound, tried and true dollar cost averaging strategy that turns Bitcoin's volatility in your favor. Once you've gotten a private wallet set up, Coinbits encourages you to withdraw your Bitcoin to your own private wallet and embrace the Bitcoin standard way of life. Start stacking on coinbitsapp.com and save your time and energy in the soundest money ever. Hello, welcome to another episode of the Bitcoin Standard Podcast. Our guest today is Matt Odell, who is a Bitcoin entrepreneur and expert. If such a thing does exist in the world of Bitcoin, I don't like using the term, but he's been around the block when it comes to Bitcoin hardware and software for a while. And he's established a name and credibility for himself for being a very honest person who gives very useful recommendations for people on how to use Bitcoin and how to interact with the network. And we're hosting Matt today to give us his ideas of how to best use Bitcoin, how to uh, best practice Bitcoin. So a little bit more about Matt. He hosts the Citadel Dispatch, an interactive live show about Bitcoin freedom, privacy, and open source software. And he's the co-founder of several Bitcoin-focused businesses, including Bitcoin TV, OpenSats, Bitcoin DevList, and Final Message. And he joins us today to discuss basically Bitcoin best practices. If I were to give an overarching theme of what I'd like to discuss with Matt today, it would be this. Um, I imagine that f- among my listeners, a lot of the listeners are more interested in the um, in, in the number go up aspect of Bitcoin, you know, just uh, thinking of it as a kind of another financial asset. So many of them will be exposed to it through their exchange or through some kind of investment account or some kind of financial instrument. And I'd like Matt to make the case for why uh, you're missing out on all the real fun if you're doing that and why you should uh, get your hands dirty and run your own node and uh, hold your own keys and do all of those things. So Matt, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. So um, let us begin with, um, you know, what, what do you recommend for the uh, Bitcoin new? Let's say you're just somebody who chanced upon Bitcoin Twitter and took an inadvertent orange pill and found yourself listening to the Bitcoin Standard podcast today for the first time, and you're thinking of getting into Bitcoin. What is it that you recommend? How do you recommend people get into Bitcoin? Well, I mean, the first thing, and I think this goes out to to a lot of uh, your audience uh, that is already experienced to a degree with Bitcoin and they're, they're onboarding friends and family, they're bringing friends and family into the Bitcoin sphere, To me, the number one thing that a newcomer should do in the beginning is receive some Bitcoin on a mobile wallet, send it, back up, restore, go go through the basics of sovereign Bitcoin usage. And it's it's surprisingly simple. You can spend hours, years, days. I mean, me and Safe have spent spent years uh, focused on going deep onto Bitcoin. But, But the cool part of Bitcoin to me is is not its complexity the cool part about bitcoin to me is its simplicity 
And at its core, when you when you actually want to interact with the network, it's as easy as installing an app on your phone. You guys all have tons of apps on your phone already. Um, you know, my my favorite mobile wallet for beginners is Moon Wallet uh, with two U's. Um, and usually, what I do uh, if I have someone that that seems like they're interested in in what Bitcoin is about is I have them install Moon Wallet. Uh, instead of sending them to some regulated exchange and and just wiping my hands clean and saying, you know, go go sign up for this and figure it out yourself. I'll send them a little Bitcoin uh, to get to get their their feet wet, get their hands dirty. And um, and then I'll have them send that Bitcoin somewhere else, whether that's to me or whether that's to a donation address or or, or some kind of, of website where you can see it instantly transfer. You, you see actually the magic happen. Um, so for me, that's that's the first step. I mean, we could talk about hardware wallets. We could talk about nodes. We could talk about all these different, more complex ways of using Bitcoin. But at its core, you're literally just installing a mobile wallet. Uh, you're not going through any regulatory procedures. You're not asking permission of anyone. You're not uploading your ID. Um, and you're able to instantly transfer value anywhere in the world, relatively cheap, very fast. Yeah, it's a pretty compelling... <laughs> value proposition if you ask me but then again i'm biased uh, but uh, yeah that is a good uh, place to start and why what is what is your case for self-custody so all right so you've played around a little bit and you know you, that wallet seems to work um why should you want to take uh, ownership you know why why don't you just keep a small sum of uh, bitcoin on your phone but then keep the rest with an exchange or with a financial institution you know we've been at as a society, we've been basically groomed into this world where we give up all personal responsibility in everything we do. Uh, we have organizations that, that treat us like children, that hold our hands. Every, every aspect of our lives, our hands are held. To me, Bitcoin and the greater open source movement is about a move back to personal responsibility. And so this idea of self-custody is is radical personal responsibility it's it's you holding um your wealth yourself uh without a third party that is not really possible outside of bitcoin you can hold you know gold coins gold bars um you can hold precious metals uh, obviously if you have cash under your under your mattress i'm i'm sure your audience is aware that ultimately you're you're holding an iou that is controlled by someone else so i don't really think you can self custody fiat um, so bitcoin is 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 a is essentially is a paradigm shift but it's a paradigm shift back to the way it used to be which is, is radical personal responsibility i just spent a lot of time uh, teaching ranchers how to use bitcoin and, you know, ranchers, farmers get it. These small family farms, like they've only lived in a world of radical personal responsibility. They never left it. Um, their whole life is 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 in their hands. Um, and every decision they make is a make or break decision. So so to me, the, the, the fundamental value prop of Bitcoin is this self-sovereignty aspect. Um, and you do not achieve that if if you are asking permission or if you're trusting someone else to to hold your Bitcoin for you. Yeah, um, and I think the, you're very correct on this different approach of uh, responsibility because the way that the current monetary system, the fiat monetary system works is that effectively it's all uh, pretend money. You know, everybody's dealing with pretend money and everything is uh, pretend until the central bank signs off of it. And at any point in time, the central bank can come and basically change anything. You know, they can go back to your bank and can take things out because of something you did months ago. Um, so in, effectively, it's a, uh, it's a loyalty scheme. It's a loyalty uh, points scheme for government where, um, you know, if you play along nicely, if you are politically on the right side, you get to keep your, uh, uh, you know, your coins, your fake monopoly money to play in this game. And, and of course, these are constantly also being devalued through inflation. So I think... Um, you know, part of the reason that people have a hard time understanding how a free market economy works is because money is so divorced from being um, a method of communicating how a market works, because money is this make believe <laughs> system of points, you know, you know, that um, what's that TV show? Um, 
whose line is it anyway so uh, um, the lines are made up and the points don't matter that's basically fiat you know it's uh, <laughs> government can make up any points at any point in time and you know anybody can become rich or uh, poor regardless of what they do um, in terms of producing value to society but just by being uh, politically loyal and so the result of this is that people just don't understand how money actually works and they think that this is why you know those anti-capitalist anti-market ideas become so popular because people see all around them people who are not productive end up with a lot of money and people who are productive end up with little money and it's all because it's a fake system of money and you know you might not like um initially the um, added responsibility of handling your own uh, bitcoin uh, but I think, you know, the, the, the downside of it is that you end up with a system where somebody else basically holds everybody's money, uh, not just yours. And then you live in a society in which work is divorced from money eventually. Yeah, I mean, I, it's, it's easy to get overwhelmed uh, when you enter the Bitcoin space. Uh, one of the, the number one things I tell people is, you know, we, we were all there at some point when we got in. You, you don't want to... You don't want to get discouraged. You don't want to. It's 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 not all or nothing. It's not um, something that happens. You know, with a flick of the wrist, one morning you wake up and you decide like I'm going to be self sovereign and I have to do like all the steps. Um, you know, to be as radically self sovereign as possible. Uh, what I say to people is, you know, dip dip your toes in. If if you feel more comfortable holding Bitcoin with a financial institution, uh, that's completely reasonable. It comes with its own trade-offs. I mean, you're trusting them with complete control of, of, of this asset, arguably the most scarce asset we've ever seen in our lifetimes and will ever see. Um, but that is a trade-off you're making. There's, there's no rule that says, you know, you have to do 100% of one or 100% of the other. What I say to people is, you know, in the beginning, you know, get your feet wet, store some of it in a self-sovereign way, you know, fine, keep some with, with a, uh, with a regulated institution that, that hopefully you trust and you've, you've done some research on them. Um, and then over time, you will naturally end up in a situation where you're not going to want to keep uh, your Bitcoin with, with these institutions. There is a, there is a mindset shift that happens once you start to get familiar and more comfortable with using Bitcoin in a sovereign way. And it makes interacting with every other asset, interacting with bureaucracies, financial institutions seem incredibly antiquated. It makes it almost, you, you have this mindset shift where to me, it's more overwhelming, more stress inducing, uh, more mentally taxing uh, to not have sovereignty over my funds and to have to ask permission, to have to remember passwords and sign in and hope that there's not another KYC check or hope that the website's not down or hope that the bank hours are, are not closed and that the phone lines are working at their antiquated institution that they set up all the infrastructure in the 70s. Like that to me becomes the stressful part rather than actually holding my own keys. And th that just comes with comfort, that comes with time, that comes with practice uh, and getting used to, to, to how, all this, how all this works. Yeah, absolutely. And I think I, I should say that, um, you know, for anybody listening, you know, make your own mind up. Don't take any of this as gospel because uh, there are risks and trade-offs involved with everything. So there is a, there's a recent trend of people saying, you know what? Um, noobs can't handle their own private keys. Private keys are not for grandmas and uh, they're not for your um, average user. Therefore, you know, shadowy super coders in their, uh, in their hoodies in the dark working on laptops. And, th and you shouldn't really put serious money in something like that because you can't handle your private key. And while, you know, I, I, I could sympathize with that, that, yeah, I can imagine, you know, I know people that would have trouble handling um, private keys or, or don't have the ability to do them, perhaps. But I think, you know, that doesn't mean that all the other alternatives don't involve risks. And so the question you need to ask yourself is, what are the risks involved with everything? Because there's no there's no magic bullet. You know, this is the kind of fiat thinking where opportunity cost doesn't exist and real trade offs don't exist, where we just press a button and then the problem is solved, you know, just give your money to an exchange and then the exchange will keep you safe. It doesn't work that way. If you're trusting your exchange, 
that means they're in a position to be able to take advantage of you and all the many people that are uh, trusting them and not just you know the company itself but also um, actors within the company or actors from outside the company you have to worry about getting sim swapped you have to understand what a sim swap is and you have to make sure that you don't do it do it because hundreds or maybe thousands of people have been sim swapped out of their uh, bitcoins on exchanges so risks exist everywhere and i think you know um, you know matt is is not out there telling people you know you have to do this it's it's more about here are the um, drawbacks and the benefits of these different ways and this is the case for self storage you know the case is that ultimately it's a very low time preference thing and that you put in the work early on you figure out how to keep your bitcoin safe and then that's it and then that's you know it, it just sits there it, you make the investment initially and then you don't have to spend your lifetime asking for permission and worrying about all these other attack vectors from outside um, other than the ones that you can control I like I like that you highlighted that everything does has trade-offs and um, I think that is key. I mean, a good uh, rubric, I think, when entering the space is as you're learning, as you're going down the rabbit hole, constantly ask yourself, what are the trade-offs and ask others, what are the trade-offs? And if they tell you there are no trade-offs, frankly, they're completely full of shit and that should yeah. be a red flag for you because everything, everything does have trade-offs. And to me, a vibrant, robust Bitcoin ecosystem is one where Bitcoiners have many different options with many different trade-offs. They're able to assess those risks themselves and, and choose the trade-off balances that, that best suit them. Um, and a perfect example here is, is in between self-custody, holding your keys yourself and trusting an institution with your keys. Services like Unchained Capital, for instance, uh, do something called collaborative custody. And, and that's something that's only possible with Bitcoin. You can't do that with precious metals. You can self-custody precious metals, but you can't do collaborative custody. And the idea there is when it comes down to Bitcoin, you have something called private keys. The private keys are what allow you to spend your Bitcoin. Um, we also have a concept called multi-sig, which means you need multiple private keys. Uh, you basically need multiple keys to spend that Bitcoin. And these collaborative custody options uh, you, you trust the institution with your privacy, but they can't spend your Bitcoin uh, without the key that you hold. Um, and you can use their key if you lose one of your keys. So it's, it's a shared custody model uh, where you're not trusting them with actually, with actually your funds. They can't steal your money, but you are still trusting them with your privacy. And it's, that's a nice middle ground, I think, for people especially high net worth individuals as they're starting to get their feet wet in the, in the personal responsibility side. Yeah. And this is something that is facilitated because of Bitcoin's multi-sig capabilities, which is in my opinion, I think the only actual smart contract that works so far, it's, it's the only one that has had actual commercial deployment in anything other than um, essentially the same old uh, Ponzi schemes, uh, which we've seen uh, done digitally and pre-digitally. But multisig is a true innovation of uh, time chain technology, as I prefer to call it. It's, it's something that was not possible. You couldn't, well, I mean, I guess you could argue that you could lock uh, gold um, in a safe which has several locks and several people have the keys and they need to meet to make it uh open it but again still your trust um you, you, the, the lock itself is um is not what's holding the key the gold because the person who has physical custody of the uh safe itself can crack it open even if they don't have the keys so it's not quite the same thing there's no way to crack a multi-sig so if you have one out of three keys in the multi-sig you cannot take the money that it's that is in it, which is why where it's different, uh, where it's truly a, a move forward technologically in our ability to store and custody money. So, um, what what are your kind of recommendations in terms of uh, um, private key uh, solutions, private key handling, or some people like to say wallets um, or hardware devices? What do you what do you recommend in terms of um, uh, which options or what are the what, are, what are, actually let's phrase it this way it's not about what you recommend what are the trade-offs of different options it doesn't matter what you recommend as much as the trade-offs so i mean you have many different options at your disposal um we're fortunate enough as bitcoiners that we have a thriving open source ecosystem that is being built around bitcoin uh that is available uh at our disposal and um 
so so i i think when you get your feet wet you use mobile wallet um i like moon wallet with two use as i said before um it's a good beginner wallet uh very user friendly easy ux you can back it up yourself you don't have to trust moon with the backup um then after you graduate from that um the next step is is for most people is probably a is what we call a hardware wallet or a hardware signer which is basically a a little dedicated device um, that holds your private key for you and makes it easy for you to interact um, with a connected computer or connected phone uh, that is is handling the construction of the transaction but your actual private key never leaves the device um, my favorite in that regard is called cold card there's there's these two guys nvk um, and peter who work on it out of canada just they they think of a lot of different paranoid things for you and kind of do that paranoia element out of the box um, and you're able to use that hardware wallet or hardware signer however you want to call it um, you're able to use that with the software of your choice so on on the software side i really like sparrow wallet that's my hat right now that's developed by this guy named craig raw out of south africa fully open source wallet. You can install it on your computer. It works with Mac, Linux, Windows. So that basically is your portal to your Bitcoin wallet. And then the cold card is a separate device that's that that holds your holds your secret, holds that private key and keeps it secure. So if your computer gets compromised, you have a privacy risk, but your funds cannot be easily stolen because they are on that separate device. Someone has to get physical access to that separate device. Uh, it has a, a pin pad on it. If they don't have your pin, if they enter the pin wrong a certain amount of times, it automatically wipes. Maybe sophisticated actors can, when you're talking about like the NSA or something, spend hundreds of thousands of dollars to extract that secret from the device. Um, but basically, NBK and Peter keep releasing new versions as these theoretical vulnerabilities happen. But if it's like a if it's like a maid or just like a, a normal thief, like an average thief or whatever, like they are most likely not going to be able to get into this device. You could think of it as one of the most secure safes um, on the market in that kind of regard. Yeah. And it's um, what I like about it. Uh, the cold card is that it, um, as you said, it takes the, uh, it does all the Bitcoin stuff on the wallet itself rather than on the device. And that's, that's really uh, important because the attack vectors when you're connected to the internet, when you're using, when you're performing uh, the signing on the device that's connected to the internet, are much more sophisticated than, are much more uh, uh, plentiful than if you're doing it with an uh, with a detached device, right? Yeah, this is. I mean, this is a theory we call cold storage. So basically, we can't all be shadowy super coders and programmers and inspect all the code we run. Uh, we should basically all be operating under the situation that our computers are compromised and our phones are compromised. So if you're in that situation and you're a non-technical user, what is the single biggest way to protect yourself? And the single biggest way to protect yourself is to make sure that those private keys that you control your Bitcoin never touch the internet. And, and why does that help? Because if they never touch the internet, if they're never on an internet connected device, then that means if someone wants to attack you, if someone wants to take your Bitcoin, they have to physically get that device. They can't hack you from India or China or the Philippines or Seattle. Like they have to come into your home or your office and they have to have that device in their hand in order to take your money. Yeah, and that completely changes the risk dynamic. And again, of course, you know, it doesn't make anything perfect. There are still attack vectors involved with everyone, but realistically, uh, you know, you need to assess them um, and, and, and see which ones are the most relevant in your case? Where do you really think, you know, do you think the NSA is going to be coming after you or do you think it's, uh, or do you think you just need a place where if you're, um, uh, you know, you, you, some, some, somebody just walks into, a burglar is more likely to walk into your house that they can't just inadvertently walk away with your uh, Bitcoin private keys um, if they're just stealing stuff. If that you think is the most likely scenario, then you need to protect against that perhaps with a kind of, multi-sig solution it's about re it's about reducing your risks as much as possible uh not eliminating them completely um not being the lowest hanging fruit you know not being the slowest person running from a bear while still balancing convenience uh and simplicity because you don't want we see 
the overwhelming amount of Bitcoin that is that is lost or stolen is lost. It is it is lost because people overcomplicate it. They decide I'm going to try and you know be a shadowy super coder and protect myself from the NSA. And they overcomplicate it. They forget their passwords. They forget what kind of complicated system they decided to do three years earlier. Um, and they lose access to their Bitcoin rather than it being stolen. So you want to balance. Those are basically the, the, the main trade-off in, in this world is convenience versus privacy and security. So you want to find a nice balance in between the two of those. So you're not shooting yourself in the foot, but you're still relatively secure and relatively private. Yeah, no, that's, that's a very good way of putting it. Now, what do you think about um, uh, skipping hardware wallets and going with uh, paper wallets and having redundant copies? Do you think that's a, that's a good thing? Because some people are worried about the, uh, you know, the NSA cracking into their hardware wallet, or they think, you know, maybe there are exploits that could be deployed on hardware wallets. Do you think that's a, that's a good way to do it? Because I mean, you could generate on you could generate your private keys on an internet uh, on on a device that's not connected to the internet. Um, I mean, I think I, it's a fair conversation to have. Once again, everything does have trade offs. Um, if you're buying a device from uh, a company, obviously that company will know what your mailing address is that you ship it to. Um, they're able to potentially swap out the device. Uh, for a compromised device or someone in the middle, we've we've seen uh, NSA level act. We've seen the NSA specifically get called out. Um, I believe in the Snowden leaks where they were replacing Cisco routers uh, with compromised Cisco routers, like in the shipping facility. So Cisco presumably didn't even know about it. So that's definitely an attack vector um, that should be considered. I think your age is showing a little bit because. When I first got into Bitcoin, and I believe when you first got into Bitcoin, we didn't really have a developed hardware wallet ecosystem. Multisig didn't exist yet. Um, the first cold storage wallet I made was on a Linux computer uh, that wasn't connected to the internet, connected to a printer. I printed out three paper wallets. So essentially the private key is on this piece of paper, three copies of the same one, just in case one of the papers uh, got destroyed. And then I destroyed both the computer and the printer. Um, so it cost me about $900. Uh, it, was, it was a fun experience destroying the printer specifically because there was more physical parts that were breaking. <laughs> but you know, you could do that. That is an option. I think hardware wallets on the trade-off balance model are, are significantly easier to use and interact with. Um, when you're talking about paper wallets, one of the main issues you will have is when it comes time to spend it, uh, you are going to have to connect it to some kind of internet connected device. Hardware wallets are designed so you can relatively safely connect to an internet connected device, sign transactions, use it on a relatively often basis without feeling, without having your private keys compromised. With paper wallets, you know, that part is up to you, how you handle that. And there's some nuance there and attack vectors, issues you can make. Um, I think if you're, if you're, if you're truly concerned and you have a higher amount that's where multi-sig comes into play and is really helpful because with multi-sig, what you can do is, you know, so the cold card is my favorite hardware wallet, but fortunately we do have other solid hardware wallets out there. There's one project called Seed Signer where you can build your own hardware wallet yourself um, from off the shelf parts for about $60. Foundation Devices has a hardware wallet uh, that they forked from cold card. Um, and then since then cold card changed its code. So, Foundation Devices has this different code base going forward than Cold Card does. Um, there's obviously the treasures are still there. So, if, so where I'm going with this is if you are concerned about Cold Card being compromised and you don't want to trust the single manufacturer, what you can do is you can actually have a multi-sig where you have these multiple keys that are required to spend your funds um, and you can set it up so, you know, maybe you have three hardware wallets and you need two of them to spend. And what that means is, is two of those hardware wallets need to be compromised um, for you to, to lose your funds and lose your ability to, to access your funds. So I, I think that trade-off balance is probably makes more sense at this point than using paper wallets. If your concern is hardware tampering, um, for, fortunately, multi-sig has gotten easier to use. It will get even easier to use over the next six months or so. Um, Sparrow Wallet that I mentioned earlier, 
not only can you easily use it with your hardware wallet, you can also easily use it to set up a multi-sig on yourself. And you can also easily use it to connect to your own node. Um, so it kind of scales up with you as you improve your knowledge and you can keep using that same software stack. Um, there's also another um, software uh, called Nunchuck that is, is in development right now. I wouldn't trust it with large amounts of funds because uh, it's relatively new but it aims to make that multi-sig process even easier for you um, in terms of setting it up and, and, and then using it going forward. Yeah, I think the idea here is when you, um, you know, when you, when you diversify your hardware, you necessitate that the attacker would have to compromise two supply chains at the same time in order to spend your coins, which um, makes it much, much, much more unlikely than it already is. But yeah, you're right on the paper wallets. I think uh, some people, uh, you know, if you're going to go through the uh, paranoia of um, destroying a computer f to make a wallet, it's worth remembering that basically anytime you're going to be spending from that address, <laughs> you need to either destroy a computer. Uh, <laughs> it gets expensive really quickly. Yeah, it gets expensive because the <laughs> transaction fee is like a new computer every time. So it's not very, uh, it's not very uh, affordable. I mean, I can see where it would, uh, and I think that there's also the other problem is just that if you, uh, a lot of people have made this mistake in the early days where they put in the private key and they spend a part of the coins. And then they, um, if you, if you don't uh, send the change back to the address, I think it, it without the paper wallet, it's just basically gone. Uh, so you need to be uh, very careful. You need to basically, throw away every private key when you spend. I think that's the, if you're gonna, if you're gonna go through the paranoia of making a private key from an, int I mean, you don't have to destroy the laptop. I mean, you could keep the laptop offline, I guess. If you have a laptop that you just keep offline, perhaps, but then again, that could also be compromised in other ways. Right, someone can get the, the laptop after you generate, that's why the laptop gets destroyed because someone could access the laptop afterwards or the printer. And the reason the printer is destroyed is because printers, modern day printers, most of them store your printouts in memory uh which a lot of people don't realize especially if you're using like an office printer or something like not only is it stored in memory but it's accessed by a lot of people so you don't want to do that uh, but yeah that goes into basically what that change issue people lost coin that way um that goes into basically that nuance that when it comes time to spend you're on your own you have to handle that in a secure way hardware wallets attempt uh to automate that and i would just say you know once again, like this goes back to trying to keep it relatively simple. You don't want, you don't want to overthink things. And, and we see a lot of people, you know, you, you get into this, some people get stuck in this mindset where they're, they're including the NSA in their threat model. And when I say threat model, what I mean is you have to think on your, in your own situation, what are my largest threats? What am I trying to protect against? And if you're trying to protect yourself against the most sophisticated intelligence agency in the world, um, with basically an endless budget, uh, you're going to have a bad time. You're going to get overwhelmed. You're going to end up in a very complicated position. Uh, when in the reality of the situation, if you try and think about it practically and trying to think about it in a pragmatic way, um, you really want to protect yourself from those 99% of threats underneath that. And, and when you look at attacks, what happens usually is it's the lowest hanging fruit. Um, so we talk a lot about how mobile wallets are maybe they're not great for larger amounts. Uh, because they're hot wallets, they're connected to an internet connected device. But to this day, we haven't seen any real major hacks of mobile wallets. What do we see? We see super low hanging fruit stuff, getting tricking people into entering their secret backup words into a compromised website, sending them emails, telling them, you know, if you send us Bitcoin, we will send you double back. And then they never send you double back. Uh, what do we see on the government side? We see 99% of people coming into regulated exchanges giving full ID information, leaving their coins on exchange, and then there's just a button press to take it. So I think uh, as Bitcoiners, it's good that we have an adversarial mindset, that we try and think of all these different threat vectors. But in reality, when we do see the attacks, you know, 99% of these attacks are going to be super, you know, primitive attacks on low hanging fruit uh, that they hit at scale. And they just hope as long as they get like 5% of people, 2% of people, 3% of people, that's a lot of money for them. And they don't have to go and attack uh, people that are even just a little bit more secure. Yeah, I, <laughs> that's, that's a good point. Basically, 
um, that there's there's so much hang, low hanging fruit, particularly in the Bitcoin world, because as we were discussing earlier, people don't really understand the concept of responsibility with money. And I think a part of this is um, the culture of financial regulation, which was invented as a concept after fiat primarily in, in, in its modern form, has made people think that if you are able to invest in something, that means the government has given it the green light, that means it's good. Whereas if the government hasn't given it the green light, then it's bad. And people just sort of assume that if it's if it's available, then it must be good. You know, obviously they wouldn't let it. There's somebody there. There's always a watchman watching out for me. And they know they wouldn't let those guys uh, be out there uh, doing things. And so therefore, people are extremely trusting. You know, they see a website that says, give us your Bitcoin, we'll give you double the Bitcoin. They'll put their money into it. And that's why, you know, if you want to steal Bitcoin, just go do something like that. It's much easier than, you know, um, getting violent and attacking others. And of course, you know, the most common way that people lose their Bitcoin and people get scammed out of their Bitcoins, of course, is shitcoins. That's that's the really easy way. I mean, really, instead of going and attacking people, just go set up a shitcoin and um, dump it. I, generally, I think you're going to have a better return. Uh, but, you know, I, I don't recommend shitcoinery, but I would recommend it over violent crime. <laughs> Given the choice, <laughs> I still prefer it to violent well, that's crime. That's good. I'm glad, I'm glad you <laughs> recommend it over violent crime. Yeah, I mean, shitcoiners and I can see eye to eye on one thing. We mean like... something. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, shit coins are one, I mean, probably one of the, the main ways people lose their Bitcoin, obviously. Um, and I think most of us have been there. Most of us, you know, I, I'm a big, my, a lot of people call me a doomer. They think I'm pessimistic. My, my optimism, I'm an opt, I'm an optimist, but I'm a realistic optimist. And, and basically I'm optimistic that as a society, as we get burned, uh, we will learn and we will improve. And, and we've never really been in this situation before where there's almost total control by institutions and states combined together. They're all like intertwined at this point. Um, and basically what I expect to happen is is people are going to get burned. And then as they get burned, whether that's on shit coins, whether that's um, on scams, other scams besides shit coins, uh, whether that's in regulated institutions. I mean, you mentioned shit coins, but a big thing this cycle has been uh, institutions promising so-called yield, we will give you 6% on your Bitcoin, people sending their Bitcoin into those institutions, giving up their sovereignty, giving up their privacy, and then getting rug pulled and losing their money. So you, you have these, uh, what is it, like a marshmallow test is what they call them, uh, where it's, you know, you're basically being tested all the time. Uh, and, and you know you won if you end up with more Bitcoin at the end of the day or at least not less Bitcoin at the end of the day uh, than when you started, because everyone's a scammer. Everyone wants to take your Bitcoin. Uh, and there's a, there's a million different ways you can lose it. So it's up to you to, and it's up to you to make sure that your Bitcoin stack grows and that it's available uh, for use, you know, by your future children and grandchildren and their grandchildren. Yeah. Here, I think I'm going to bring in a little bit of good old Ludwig von Mises, and, uh, you know, I think a very useful way of navigating the world of uh, Bitcoin and digital currencies and uh, uh, Bitcoin financial institutions is to just remember the very basic insight that money itself cannot yield return. Money itself is not a chicken that can lay eggs. Money is not a cow that can make um, more cows. It's not an asset that is uh, that, that can get pregnant and produce more of itself. If you put money in a room and you lock it up for 100 years and you come back, you're going to find it sitting there still in the same exact quantity. Gold or papers or bitcoins have no mechanism for spontaneously increasing in quantity. So therefore, the only way that you can make more of whatever form of money, whether it's dollars or bitcoin or gold, is that somebody is going to need to take those things exchange them for something that makes other things you know so you take the gold you sell it you buy a cow you take the bitcoin you sell it you buy chicken uh, for the bitcoin you exchange it for chicken you take the chicken you take the cow you take the lemons you turn them into more chicken more cows and lemonade and then if you make more chicken more cows more lemonade than the cost of the chicken and cows and lemonade and lemons that went in then you've turned in a profit and you can bring in a profit to the person who uh, made the investment but there's no way that you could get any kind of return without 
spending the money. It can't make a return if it stays in the form of money. So if you put a money with somebody and they tell you that the money is there and it's available for you, but it's also going to make a return, that's the red flag. That's that's they're telling you you can have your cake and you can eat it too. You can keep eating your cake forever, but you always have the cake. It doesn't work that way. If the money is producing a return, then it's been exchanged into a productive good. Money is not a productive good on its own. And it's been exchanged into a productive good, and so it's making more. So then you need to understand what good is it being exchanged for and understand that there's no such thing as no risk. And there's no such thing as protected downside. Every single business enterprise in the history of humanity has always had the risk of complete and catastrophic loss. Everything can go to zero overnight. Anything, everything, you know. Um, uh, every single business that has ever existed could, could go to zero you know you could get an earthquake that swallows the entire business and all of its capital and it's gone it happens and you know these things happen so risk is always there the idea that you can just protect against risk through financial engineering is fiction an earthquake can eat the financial engineers too <laughs> before they could do anything about it so i never realized you were so pro earthquake <laughs> <laughs> i mean it's a necessary financial corrective mechanism at a certain point in the fiat system. You'll take whatever you could get. <laughs> no, I'm joking. I'm joking. I don't support earthquakes. Um, I'm not a Keynesian. I don't think that destruction is good for GDP. I think destruction is bad. But uh, yeah, the point is there's no return without risk. And so you need to understand what the risk is. And if they're telling you you're getting a fixed return and that the downside is zero, then they're either lying to you or lying to themselves. You know, we saw with Celsius and Mashinsky. I mean, you, you see how he was speaking about it. I, I spoke to him. There was a video that was posted at uh, where I was in a conference in Hong Kong in 2019, and I was on a panel with him and Tone Vase. And uh, it, it's clear, like, he, he, he was repeating this. You might even think that he actually believed it. Like, he believed that we could take the money, run it through all of these uh, exchanges, uh, lend it out, do things, and then we'll be able to give everybody six and eight and 10% uh, yield forever. You know, we're gonna give everybody 7% forever um, because, uh, you know, the banks are evil because banks are don't, not giving people good interest rates. And it doesn't work that way. I don't know if he believed it, but, you know, clearly it's gone to zero. And I think in, 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 in a Bitcoin world, we're going to see this more and more because in a fiat world, those companies can be bailed out by fiat, but nobody can print Bitcoin to bail them out. Yeah, I mean, I think you see a lot of times scammers starting to believe their own bullshit and then they actually become more convincing scammers because they're authentically scamming you while they scam themselves. And I think, you know, it's, it's, it's highly likely that the majority of people who have gotten into these things really truly believe in them because in the fiat system, you know, banks did offer interest rates even in my lifetime. I remember when I was a kid, you know, there was a, you could make interest by putting money in a bank. It wasn't much, but there was some kind of interest. I mean, that's... Uh, I've never seen that. <laughs> I'm older than you. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you, you were probably born after Greenspan came in and then it's just been... Uh, <laughs> zerp ever since basically in practical terms yeah but people think money grows on trees people think money grows in banks just, you put your money in the bank and then the bank will just make more because you gave them the money and they kept it safe for you so it's highly likely that they would believe this would be possible with bitcoin and i think it's sad you know i know a lot of um, a lot of probably really good bitcoiners worked for celsius or put their money in bit in celsius thinking you know this is the future thinking this is uh you know we're bringing banking to bitcoin but um, no you're bringing ponzi's to bitcoin unfortunately i mean uh this just goes back to like my optimistic my pessimistic optimistic take which is um you know there was there's this guy I, I do a lot of consulting work for different bitcoin companies and there's a guy that works he was one of the higher ups at one of these orgs um, and we got into a lot of arguments about these yield products. Um, and I said, dude, you're playing with fire. Uh, you're going to get rug pulled. Uh, everyone, we, we've seen it happen a million times in Bitcoin land. And he got rugged by Celsius. He lost some money on Celsius. Fortunately, uh, he didn't have his whole stack there. He didn't have all his Bitcoin there, uh, but he had a sizable amount. And the day after withdrawals froze, uh, he, he messaged me. He was like, Matt, I get it now. Right. Like I spent hours with him trying to 
encourage him to to get off of Celsius and not use Celsius. Um, but ultimately, the the real lesson was actually losing access to those funds, and now he has a, a lifelong lesson uh, that cost him a decent amount of money, but not too much money, and he'll never forget it. Yeah, I think uh, the last few months have been uh, likely devastating to the possibility of uh, yield products in uh, I don't think so. That's like when uh, us Bitcoiners and every bear cycle are like, oh, shit coins are over. They're never coming back. I think uh, the yield schemes are just getting started. We're going to see some crazy shit uh, next cycle. <laughs> I, I think I think we'll still see shit coins. We'll still see yield products on shit coins and these kind of things. But I think... Um, the kind of, uh, you know, uh, Celsius type, you know, decent kind of uh, looking uh, semi bank looking institutions that are somehow regulated and, uh, and and raise funds. I mean, I can I can see, you know, uh, smart contract Ponzi protocols where, you know, you yield farm uh, food items like all of these things. Yeah, I think these won't die. But can you see somebody raising money for something like Celsius? The beauty of the beauty, uh, talk about quotes taken out of context. The beauty of Celsius uh, was that it was a front end for, it was essentially a front end for all the crazy DeFi yield schemes. Um, and so was Three Arrows Capital. So like they, institutions would would lend out money to Three Arrows or lend out money to Celsius or retail would go to Celsius and Celsius would lend out money to three hours capital. And then they would go and play with all the Ponzi protocols and basically hide that risk on their balance sheet. And, and then the, the front end, which was Celsius or BlockFi would say, Oh, well, we only work with, you know, reputable borrowers. Right. But the reputable borrowers were going to all the crazy shit. I, I don't think I don't think that's over yet. I think I think what we probably see is a bifurcation of the market where like Celsius was kind of, you know, one of the things they do in shitcoin land really well is they don't ask permission. They just they just go crazy and they just constantly move forward on the crazy side. And regulators are really slow to move. Uh, bureaucracy just takes really long to actually act. We see enforcement actions happen five years after the fact, six years after the fact. So there's a window of opportunity where they're able to operate these bucket shops. Um, so what I expect to happen is we're going to see a move from retail to basically say, oh, well, BlockFi survived the last collapse. They're fully regulated. They're based in the United States. They have these you know, big corporate backers. I'm going to trust the BlockFi of the world or whatever. So we see a bit, we'll basically see a consolidation, at least on the on the on the big ones. We'll see this consolidation of whoever survives, uh, but retail will still flock to it. Like people tend, first of all, people tend to choose convenience over security and privacy. So they like the regulated institutions that they consider reputable. And then the second thing is like people don't like working, so they will go for something that presents easy money with no trade-offs. And that's one thing that shitcoin promoters have been very good at, which is basically you will get rich with no risk. And one thing that I have had trouble with being public in the Bitcoin space for as long as I have is that the unfortunate reality is it seems that a lot of Bitcoiners have basically looked at the shit corners and they're like, I want to do that too. Um, I'm going to tell my audience that they don't need personal responsibility. There's no risk. There's no trade-offs and they can instantly become rich um, and have this so-called passive income. They, they, people love the meme passive income. So I really don't think... Uh, passive income is like free cheese in the mouse trap. I think the yield shit is gets even bigger. The yield market gets even bigger. Quote unquote yield market gets even bigger this next cycle and i think shit coins get we're gonna, we haven't even, we haven't even gotten to see like a sovereign state rug pull yet like there's i i yeah. think <laughs> like the shit we're about to see is going to be even crazier than any other cycle we've seen in the past yeah i should say like i mean i think uh yeah the shit coins will likely continue to get bigger but the uh, that doesn't mean uh, that investing in them is a wise choice because you don't know which ones are going to get bigger and so it's gonna be different ones and every cycle you have different pump and dumps exactly and this is 
this is why they're uh, so well suited for attracting stupid people because stupid people don't understand averages and probabilities. And so there's more than 20,000 shit coins and more than 20,000 of these shit coins have underperformed Bitcoin. Um, you know, very, very few shit coins have, over, have outperformed Bitcoin for any kind of uh, sustainable period. And those that have, have mostly only really outperformed Bitcoin for the very early people who got in really early, particularly basically the people who launched the shitcoin. So the vast, vast majority of normal people, you know, if you're a normal human being who does something with their life and has an income and has money and has savings, would like to put them in a place, if you get into shitcoin, the odds of you coming out with a lot of money on the other side are very, very, very low. You know, you only, of course, on Twitter, you only see the successes because the people who put in uh, $8,000 and then lost them, they're not out there going on Twitter every day saying, hey, I lost $8,000 to shit coins. But the guy who put in $8,000 and then um, bought a Lambo is out there on Twitter <laughs> posting Lambo every day and making you think that everybody who puts in $8,000 comes out with a Lambo. But the vast majority of people who put $8,000, you know, they put it into shit coins that are just, if you go to coin market cap, you know, the vast majority of them are just flatlining in Bitcoin terms. They're declining in value. So, so getting into it, it's, it, you know, it's, it's not like you're, you're selling out and then you're going to make money. I think a lot of the Bitcoin influencers seem to portray this, that, you know, if you get into shit coins, you make money, but all of us Bitcoiners are, um, you know, we, we're choosing to make less money because of principle. Um, even if the principle were the case, I think that even if you weren't principled, if you were just a little bit intelligent about probabilities, you'd realize that the only way that you can really make money in shit coins is to be um, essentially an insider in these because otherwise trading day in and day out, you know, there's no way to tell today which are going to be the best uh, shit coins in five years from now. And similarly, you know, all the people who tell you should get into shit coins, they wouldn't tell you um, what you should be getting into over the next five years. So what you need to do is daily active management the daily following of the shitcoin markets in order to be able to flip the right thing at the right time and not get rugged and of course it only takes one rug one bad trade to uh, ruin 100 genius trades and so, uh, so, so so the end result of this is that you're constantly taking on extra risk and the only people that it works for are the people who basically do it as a full-time job and get in early and I'll just, I, I know you want to get in, but I just want to add one thing. And this is why I think, yeah, I think, this is why I think there's a cultural difference really between Bitcoiners and shitcoiners in that everybody who thinks of money as something you save in, you know, I already worked, I, you know, I'm a, I'm a cab driver, I'm a doctor, I'm a dentist, I'm an engineer, I did my job, I earned my money. And now I just want to keep it there so that I can have it indefinitely for the future, because that's what money does to secure me and my children. People who have that mentality get Bitcoin. Yeah. Oh, I could just buy Bitcoin and nobody can print more of it. Great, I can focus on being a doctor and I don't need to be a stock picker every day of my life. I don't need to follow monetary policy. I don't need to uh, follow um, you know, commodities markets and global geopolitics and uh, all of that stuff in order to know what to do with my portfolio. I'm just gonna save in something that nobody can print and focus on being a good dentist. Shitcoiners, their culture, as you said, is, it, it, you know, I want to quit being a dentist because I'm going to take all of my life saving, put them in a shitcoin, and then I'm going to 100x and then quit being a dentist. There's always this idea that, you know, well, I can't just buy Bitcoin because it's not making a yield. I need something to make a yield because I need something that's going to replace me having to be a dentist because I don't want to be working. I don't want to be productive. So it's a way to get out of being productive and hit the jackpot. Whereas for Bitcoiners, it's a way to focus on being productive and have a place to save. Yeah, I mean, I think I think you nailed it, Safe. Um, you know, I, I I think it goes back to this this the simplicity comment I made earlier. Like at the core, like we live in this ridiculous society where we've been trained uh, that you either need to be a proficient financial professional or you have to hire someone to manage your wealth in order to trade markets in order to save money, um, which is insane. And and, and the Bitcoin value prop that it offers to people um, is this idea that you can just save your wealth and focus on living your life. You can do whatever the fuck you want to do. Um, and at the end of the day, you're able to hold this asset, um, keep stacking it, 
And over time, it should increase in purchasing power. And I, I, this goes way past just shit coins. It's trading. It's trading in general. Yes, you should not be trading. 99.99% of people should not be trading as a living. Yeah, they will lose more money trading than if they just stay humble and stack sats. And so this idea, first of all, that uh, I as a Bitcoiner think you can't make money on shit coins or trading Bitcoin is false. Of course you can make money. Some people will. Most people will lose more money than if they just stay humble and stack sats. And it's not this like, um, I'm not, you know, doing this great moral thing by 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 not participating in these potential shitcoin profits or Bitcoin trading profits with leverage. No, I know that I will have more money for my children and my grandchildren uh, if, if I stay humble and stack sets. So that's what I do. And if anyone doesn't believe me or safe on this, what I would say to you is take 2% of your stack and try and trade with it. You will lose that 2%. And then instead of doubling down and putting another 2% in, just learn from that fucking lesson <laughs> and, and stay humble and stack sets going forward. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd add to that is, you know, if you think you can beat that, um, sh show me today what you're going to be doing over the next five years to beat that. And if, it, if your recipe is, I'm going to wake up every morning and follow the shitcoin market and figure out which uh, new stupid uh, dog coin is going to moon next, then... <laughs> You know, I'm sorry for your loss of a life, you know, for your life in that case. Like, w what kind of existence is it to just wake up every morning and see which uh, which group of teenagers in the world is going to get rug pulled um, by a stupid meme today so that you can feed your kids? I mean, um, if active daily trading of shitcoins is your strategy, it's not going to work. And also, it's no way to live. Like, really, it's not. there's no amount of money that you could pay me so that I could spend all my life having to manage this so you have to really and th this is the problem with you know shitcoiners and fiaters they all are so adamant that no you can't just hold bitcoin and just tell them, all right what do you suggest instead of it like nasim talib is always going on about bitcoin being bad all right show us your portfolio how do you beat bitcoin of course they can't tell you because they're holding you know he used to tell people to hold 80 percent bonds and then invest 20 percent in some crazy uh, ideas that might work out. Well, that might have worked 15 years ago. Today, you're losing about 5-10% a year on your bonds, maybe. And uh, your 20% long shots are likely going to come back at like something like 1% most of the time. So you're losing 10-20% you know, for with any strategy today, with any strategy because of inflation, all of the financial gurus of Wall Street all of their strategies are basically just a mechanism for you to donate wealth to your government. Um, you, you're getting robbed by inflation, whatever you do, and none of these people can can reliably show you that they can beat inflation, let alone beat Bitcoin. You know, I'm not telling you, asking you to beat Bitcoin returns. Just show me that you can beat inflation as measured by the increase in the money supply, not the CPI. Show me that you can beat that over five years. Yeah, because if you're if you're not beating inflation, you're losing money. Uh, I mean, I I think I think. The, the fiat coiners have kind of come to the same conclusion out of, of, as us, and they just don't even realize it. I mean, it's a weaker conclusion, but basically what you see advocated to retail most of the time now uh, with professional financial advisors, uh, which I, I can, almost can't even say without a smile on my face, is to buy index funds, right? And why do they say to buy index funds is they say you're competing against a whole world of traders. Um, and you're going to fail at doing that. So buy an index fund that's all the companies in one fund. Um, and, and as global production improves, as, as, as humanity scales, uh, you should reap the benefits of that. Well, to me, Bitcoin is essentially a replacement for that index fund on steroids, which is this, this single global ledger that records all of our wealth, um, that is scarce, that is easy transferable, that doesn't require permission uh, and that should increase in purchasing power as adoption increases. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's, it's just insane. The idea that everybody needs to manage their money. In my mind, this is as insane as going back to a world in which everybody needs to manage their sewage every day. I mean, imagine if you needed to be a part of your day every day was that you needed to be your local, uh, your house's own sewage engineer. At the end of the day, you needed to go to your sewage 
and do things with your hands so that the sewage is processed. You know, we, we, we got this to stop being an automated thing. And this is effectively what fiat has done to money. You know, money had always been the thing that we used as saving. And it was just this automating, this automated process where, you know, you got paid in a gold coin and then you took the gold coin and you put it under your mattress and it stayed there. And you didn't have to wake up every morning and study what is the, what's happening between the Japanese uh, central bank and the American central bank so that your gold coin works. You know, it just sits there and it works and it holds on to value and it appreciates a little bit. Well, now to replace that, it's, you know, the, the, you could think of that as being the, ana the analog to modern uh, waste wall, waste treatment and modern sewage. You know, there used to be a time where we had outhouses and then we had people come and actually take the uh, feces from the outhouses in order to clean it. That was a job. You know, this was what, uh, what what people did in cities. They went around and they collected shit from other people's homes. So that uh, that was, you know, that was the sewage system that we had. And then modern sewage, you know, piping and modern industrialization and the glorious beauty of hydrocarbon fuels allowed us to build all those systems where now we don't need to hire somebody to come and take our poop and it's just automated and it's that similar to the gold coin you know and and they both came around at the same time at the, and the, the late 19th century the whole world was saving in gold and holding uh, and you know installing modern sewage and now we've gone back now we've gone back no you have to wake up every morning and follow the wall street journal and bloomberg and see what the Fed said, and do they really mean that they're going to tighten? And did he really mean that? And is he really going to do that? Bitcoin fixes this. It's all shit and earthquakes, folks. <laughs> all right. So the other thing that I want to talk to you about is privacy. So we've gotten into, um, you know, you, you've stored your keys, you figured out how you're going to be storing them. Um, how do you recommend staying private? Or well, first of all, why do you recommend staying private? We've we discussed this with Giacomo a couple of weeks ago, but I want to get your take as well. Why is privacy important on Bitcoin? Why should you care to be private? Why not just, you know, who cares? So one of my major passions in Bitcoin is privacy and particularly digital privacy in general. So I spent a lot of time talking about this and thinking about it. And... Um, might be the thing I most disagree with Safe about. We agree on most things. The, the, the way I look at it, first of all, the way I got into Bitcoin is I, I thought it was bullshit, which I think most people get into Bitcoin that way. They say, there's no way it can work. Um, I came in already uh, relatively anti-state, not trusting of institutions. Uh, and I was like, this thing is going to get squashed, right? So I started looking at Bitcoin and basically my rubric of getting into Bitcoin was trying to prove that it wasn't going to work. And I went down all the different rabbit holes and I just, my conviction grew and grew and grew, especially over time. Because as time goes on, you know, I, I treat Bitcoin as basically this glorious open bounty system where uh, if there's a vulnerability, anyone in the world can exploit it and make a ton of money. Uh, so as time goes on, it's more robust and more secure and you can trust it more. Um, so the way I look at privacy is, first of all, privacy is a prerequisite for freedom. I don't think you can have freedom without privacy. Uh, if, if you don't have privacy, uh, people can use your private information to control you and you don't have freedom. Uh, I think freedom is a prerequisite for wealth because if you don't have freedom, uh, then it's not your money and it can be taken from you at will. So when we talk about Bitcoin as censorship resistant money, we talk about Bitcoin being hard to seize and being easy to use without permission. And when I go down that rabbit hole, the, the biggest threat to Bitcoin today is not actually to Bitcoin. Bitcoin, the network, I think is robust. I think it's really hard to shut down. I think time has proven that. I think you would basically need some kind of uh, global cooperation between major countries that hate each other and major governments that hate each other to try and take down Bitcoin. And I don't think the will is there. And I don't think history has shown that they can cooperate with each other. Uh, that is one of the coolest parts about Bitcoin is this, it's almost, you know, Bitstein has this great tweet of like, uh, 
Bitcoin consensus is like a Mexican standoff with everyone holding their gun to each other's head. But the biggest vulnerability to me, if we're talking about low hanging fruit on the state side is going after individual Bitcoiners. And that starts with privacy. And, and the key here is that Bitcoin by default is not private. Uh, most people are coming in through regulated exchanges. Uh, they're providing their full identification information. They're uploading the passport. They're uploading the driver's license. They're taking selfies of themselves. They're putting in their current home address. Um, and that is getting linked to your Bitcoin transaction history. And there's basically growing lists of Bitcoiners um, and our transaction history that are not only held by these corporations, uh, but they're shared by governments. They're stored in securely. They're leaked. They're sold. Um, so these lists are growing. Bitcoiners should be concerned about it from an individual level not on a network level. So how do we protect ourselves from that? Fortunately, there are many tools uh, that are available to Bitcoiners uh, to use Bitcoin more privately. So one aspect here is obviously that KYC record. When, you, when we say KYC, we mean know your customer. Uh, know your customer regulations attempt to prevent uh, so-called money laundering. They do not do that. Criminals know how to get around it. It only hurts law-abiding users. And what happens is we have these lists of our intimate personal information tied to our transaction history. So the first step uh, is being aware that that record exists. If you've bought on a regulated exchange, I have, many of us have, that record always exists. Safe bought this much Bitcoin on this date and he transferred it to this Bitcoin address. That record will never disappear. So you have an option there. And I, first of all, I would say on the KYC side, I think the KYC side is a temporary thing. I think, you know, one of the memes in Bitcoin is we are still so early. I think we'll stop being early when most people aren't buying Bitcoin, they're earning Bitcoin for their job. And most people aren't selling Bitcoin, they're spending Bitcoin. And when you end up in that situation, you don't have these centralized choke points that are connected to the banking system. But right now we do have those centralized choke points. So if you want to use a bank account to buy Bitcoin or sell Bitcoin, uh, you're going to provide all this intimate identification information. So you can reduce that risk by obviously either not going through the bank account connected route and doing in-person trades, uh, doing peer-to-peer -peer trades where you're sending someone fiat in some method and they're sending you Bitcoin and you're not providing this identification information. As I said earlier, you can obviously earn Bitcoin by... If you operate a business, you know, start accepting Bitcoin, maybe give a discount if people pay in Bitcoin so you can get some Bitcoin that's not a tied to your identity. And I would go back to saying that this is not all or nothing, just like with the self-custody conversation. You might have the stack that's tied to your name. And if your government turns against you, they might put a gun to your head and say, we're going to throw you in jail if you don't pay this obscene tax or if, if you don't let us take your Bitcoin. But you still have your fuck you stack. You still have the Tony Soprano duffel bag in the wall, so to speak, right? Or the breaking bad um, kegs in the floor that you know, kegs buried under underground, barrels buried underground with cash in it. So it's not all or nothing. Consider starting to build a stack that's outside of the regulated services. Um, so that's, that's one thing to consider. Another thing is if you mine, you're also able to stack Bitcoin without uh, interacting with a regulated service and asking their permission. So that's not connected to your identity. And I, I've been a big advocate of home mining, small scale home mining. And in that situation, even if you're technically losing money on your electricity bill, um, if you're losing 10% versus buying over a regulated exchange, treat that as your privacy premium or privacy discount where I'm paying that extra 10% because this Bitcoin isn't attached to my identity. Besides that, you also have something called collaborative transactions. The most common version of collaborative transaction is something called a coin join. This allows you to use Bitcoin in a way where you use it with multiple other people. And as you do that, um, it makes it harder to track you on the blockchain. So the blockchain is essentially this ledger of all Bitcoin transactions. If we are correct, this ledger is going to outsurvive all of us. It's immutable. It will never be changed. It'll just keep on going forever. But this full record of all Bitcoin transactions, if you're tied to your identity, then that ledger can be used to track your transactions going forward. Bitcoin transaction tracking is essentially a probability game. So when you use Bitcoin, unlike using Venmo or PayPal or Chase QuickPay or any of these fiat systems, you can actually send Bitcoin to yourself. So I can actually generate a new wallet 
Uh, I could send Bitcoin from my wallet to my other wallet. And so what do these surveillance companies, there's these professional surveillance companies that are tracking Bitcoin, what do they do? They're essentially assessing the probability that each transaction has changed hands and who has it changed hands to. So when we talk about collaborative transactions and we talk about using Bitcoin in a more private way, we're talking about breaking that pro probability analysis, making it so that their guesses are even less likely than they currently are. So collaborative transactions essentially allow you to construct a transaction without giving up custody of your coins because of the way Bitcoin works. You can actually do a transaction with other people. Let's imagine you do it with four other people. So there's five of you total going into a transaction and then there's five outputs going out on the other side. And all of a sudden that probability is broken. They don't know necessarily um, which input is connected to which output and their probability is, you know, at a basic probability level is 20% of which address is connected to which address. So you break that probability uh, analysis and as a result, it becomes harder to track your Bitcoin. Another aspect of Bitcoin privacy, I mean, I skipped over it already, but the first step is self-custody. If you're, if you're holding Bitcoin with a regulated institution or whatever, you're just completely trusting them with your privacy. Uh, so it's almost it's already a non-starter at that point. If, if you're holding it with them, you're trusting them with your privacy. They're going to share with governments. The, the, those lists are not stored securely. Uh, they're going to get leaked. They're going to get sold. So first step is self-custody. Second step is using your own node. So to interact with the Bitcoin node, with, to interact with the Bitcoin network, you need to use a Bitcoin node. And if you don't use your own Bitcoin node, then you're using someone else's Bitcoin node and you're trusting them with your transaction history. And you're also trusting them uh, so you're trusting them with your privacy, but you're also trusting them with validating the rules of the network. So you want to self-custody. You want to use your own node. You want to consider these collaborative transactions. I would say that's the order. And at the same time, you want to be aware of these trade-offs of using regulated institutions and trying to reduce your exposure on that side at the same time. There was a lot there. That is a lot there. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna just ask you something that I also asked uh, with Giacomo after the um, after the uh, remember there was the Bitfinex hack which recently they were uh, they were able to identify them. I think I mean we don't know it's all um, it's it's all uh, still to be determined in court, but it seems plausible that they did manage to identify them by uh, using uh, 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 chain analysis that they identify them correctly. And it seems like also this case is true for the DAO hacker for Ethereum as well. Um, some people managed to identify him. So I think I want to go back to that issue of the probabilities that you mentioned. I think I, I did not expect this to be the case initially, but I think I expected, you know, when I first heard about Bitcoin, I thought this was going to become something illegal very quickly. And for the first year or two, when I heard about it, you know, I, I thought, you know, buying it could end up um, getting you in jail. And then I thought, you know, you don't want to be buying from exchanges. And uh, if you buy from exchanges, they're going to probably come after you. And then um, for, a, for a while, I, I always thought this was going to be the way that it is going to be uh, dealt with. And if that was the case, then you can see a scenario where Bitcoin continues to grow with essentially uh, off KYC because it is fought. And so the only way that it grows is people hand it over to one another without taking copies of each other's passports. And then we, if that was the case, then today we'd have 19 million coins that are predominantly in the hands of people who earn them with no trail from KYC. This doesn't seem to have happened. What seems to have happened is that the majority of coins today are owned by people who have um, fully KYC positions. Either they're, I don't know what the exact number is, but you know, there were times in which some people said maybe as much as half of all coins or maybe even more are on uh, exchanges. So they're held by third parties. And then there's a very significant percentage other than that, that is basically one or two hops away from those third parties. And you could more or less assume that the person who KYC'd for it either has it or at least can, you know, very easily report on who has it. You know, you can ask them who's got that. Uh, you can subpoena them and then you can find out whose transaction it is. So in this situation now, since the majority of people are buying and selling Bitcoin from uh, KYC situations, do you think this compromises the ability to stay anonymous? Because, 
yes, you're mixing it in with five people, but then the five other people, what are they going to do with their coins? As Bitcoin's acceptance increases in um, and, and as it's no longer uh, restricted to only illegal uh, uses, then, all right, so you join the coin join, but, you know, you join the coin join with five other people. But uh, if the four of them then take their coins and sell them on Coinbase, then it's not very difficult to uh, I- I- identify that it was you. Yeah, I mean, you have a process of elimination situation there. And I, if, if I should just add one thing is that I think that the Bitfinex hack shows us that as time goes by, you don't get, um, it, it's not that, oh, well, now there's too many hops and now the coins are lost. On the contrary, there's too many hops. So then it just becomes easier to identify the patterns by uh, data analysis because, uh, you know, the more hops you put in, then at, uh, you, can, you can still track things down. Computers have <laughs> magical superpowers. Um. You know, I think there's a couple lessons that can be learned from the Bitfinex hack. Well, first of all, um, there's a f- phrase we, we'd like to talk about in the digital privacy world, which is privacy loves company. Um, and so ultimately, with pretty much every privacy tool that we interact with, um, you're only as private as the crowd you're amongst. Uh, so like if there's only three people in the world, I'm going to be parabolic here, but if there's only three people in the world that want to be private, um, then if if you see people being private, you know, it's one of those three people. Right. So you need more people to use privacy tools. You need more people to not use KYC. KYC is the single biggest threat we have right now. And I, I will say again that I think it's a short term threat because I think ultimately the big solution here is as Bitcoin starts to get used as a day-to-day currency, uh, most people will be earning it and most people will be spending it rather than buying and selling. Um, And then all of a sudden, those records, everything is is more distributed. It's not like everyone's using the top five exchanges or something like that. Um, With the Bitfinex hackers specifically, KYC is what got them. Uh, They made some very amateur mistakes, uh, but that is not an excuse like, that is where most privacy issues on Bitcoin stem from because the Bitcoin blockchain is forever. You might have heard the concept of the internet is forever, the Streisand effect where Barbara Streisand tried to remove a photo. Um, and as a result, people posted it everywhere. Well, the blockchain is even more forever than the internet. The internet, you might be able to purge something from. The transaction ledger will be there forever and it will outlive all of us. So if you make one little mistake, and you have a sophisticated actor that really wants to take you down, they will track down that mistake. More data becomes obvious over time. External data, stuff like purchase history, participants and collaborative transactions and stuff. And they will they will get you on that one mistake. With Bitfinex specifically, they were buying gift cards. Well, first of all, shout out to Rosalcon, by the way, the Bitfinex hacker. Richest rapper of all time for a period there. She didn't have many listeners to her rap music, but richest rapper of all time. More b- more millions than YouTube views. <laughs> she she deserves she deserves a shout out for that. Um, but they were buying gift cards essentially, and those gift cards were linked to their real life identity, and and that that's what seems to have done them in. And we we saw something similar uh, with Ross, the founder and operator of the Silk Road where basically what happened was in an early forum post, he messed something up and it was connected to a real life email address uh, that was connected to his real identity. And all it took was that one mistake, right? If people start looking, they start looking and they go back in the records and they, they find that one mistake. Now, in that case, it wasn't on the blockchain necessarily, um, but that goes back to the internet being forever. So when you're talking about sophisticated actors on the privacy side, a lot of times it can just be one little mistake that gets you um, if we're talking about average people trying to have basic financial privacy, and when I'm when I'm talking about financial privacy, like I'm not talking about running a you know a massive crime ring. Um, I'm talking about if if and a lot of people here probably aren't paid in Bitcoin yet, but I'm paid in Bitcoin for a lot of my income. Um, I don't want my boss to know what I'm spending my money on over the weekend. And I don't want, I don't want the people I'm spending money with. I don't want the guy I'm buying a sandwich from knowing how much money I make. That's ridiculous. Um, and so collaborative transactions help stop that kind of transaction tracking, uh, give you basic financial privacy. 
And the good protocols are set up in a way where I used a very uh, naive example or basic example saying you're in a collaborative transactions with four participants. Well, like for instance, the way Whirlpool is set up, which is one of the collaborative transaction protocols, is it's set up in a way that some of the participants go on to do another collaborative transaction afterwards. So you have, I'm not a mathematician, but you have this increasing, you have this increasing set of people that you're part of um, because, you know, if you have five people go into this collaborative transaction and three of them go into another collaborative transaction with five people and two of those people go into another collaborative transaction with five people, you have this growing number of people over time uh, and that probability graph gets even crazier, right? That prob probability analysis gets even crazier. Um, now, all of that can get unwound if at the end of the day you go and then spend it on a gift card site uh, that is linked to your to your real life identity. But we're not aiming here to be perfect. We're not aiming to be NSA proof. We're not aiming to be DOJ proof. The goal is some basic financial privacy and the goal is to not be the lowest hanging fruit. And any little improvement we make not only helps ourselves, but it helps everyone else that is seeking financial privacy. Yeah, I agree. And I think um, I, I said this in the Bitcoin standard and I, um, I I still, I think, stand by it, which is that Bitcoin's uh, Bitcoin's bad for privacy for criminal activity, but it's uh, not bad for privacy for things that are not criminal. In other words, I don't know if I love that take. I think I think if there's uh, like if if you have bodies to hide, if you steal somebody's uh, if you steal millions of dollars worth of Bitcoin or billions of dollars worth of Bitcoin, I mean I I don't recommend using uh, Bitcoin for that. I think you know you could you, the, here's the thing you can point at somebody like um, you know that uh, Bitfinex hacker and say well they made that mistake, and you can point at the DAO hacker and say that they made that mistake. And you could also point at other hundreds, probably thousands of people that are in prison all over the world today because they made specific mistakes. It's easy to go back and Monday morning quarterback and say, well, they made that mistake then. But the reality is that you know, you're, you're really treading on very thin ice with this kind of trying to hide your tracks on a ledger that is shared over millions of computers all over the world. If there is a body, if there is somebody who's lost money, if there's somebody who's looking for those coins, I don't like your odds. So my advice to all criminals is to stick to the tried and tested uh, through methods of dollars because um, you take somebody's dollars, you know, th th there's no way that they can track it back. There's no global uh, ledger uh, that tracks the ownership of every dollar. It makes getting rid of dollars much easier than getting rid of uh, Bitcoin if it is criminal. So, I mean, in a sense, it's it's. I, I can see why. Um, I, I can definitely see why it would work for you if you're trying to hide. You know, as you said, like from your boss, if you're trying to just uh, increase your privacy uh, on, on a personal level. But I don't know, like. <laughs> Can, can you really recommend to an actual criminal to steal money and hide it on Bitcoin? Do you think it's, uh, I mean... <laughs> well, first of all, Safe, I, I do not give advice to criminals. Um, uh, they can do their own research. Uh, cash is obviously the most private way to transact. It's got nice default privacy. Um, I would say a couple of things. First of all, there are probably hundreds of thousands of criminals that have used Bitcoin successfully privately. We don't hear about them. You hear about the ones that get caught. Yeah, but most of these have used it for what I call victimless crimes, uh, which is essentially not crimes. But I, I mean, look, I, like buying weed is not a is not a real crime. And like most but of see, the time, so that's my issue. Right. So my issue is, is Bitcoin is a global system. Right. And so I've done a lot of work with activists. Right. And these activists need a global money. They need Bitcoin. They need something like Bitcoin. But they're considered criminals by their governments. Right. And their governments are actively trying to seize their assets, trying to track their financial transactions, trying to pressure them and their families. Right. So so to me, the dream of a censorship resistant digital money that can be saved and spent at will 
there's an element there that requires relatively user-friendly privacy tools so that people can have decent privacy guarantees on them. I'm not saying it's going to be perfect. Obviously, as you as as you're dealing with more and more money, that becomes it becomes significantly more difficult to cover your tracks uh, with Bitcoin as you deal with more money. And that's why we see the large scale hacks. You know, they a, a lot of times they get caught, you know, overwhelming, overwhelming amount of times they get caught. Um, and that's because it goes back to, you know, privacy loves company. Like if you're if, if, if you're controlling $10 billion worth of Bitcoin and, you know, the privacy users in Bitcoin is like $5 billion, $5 billion worth of Bitcoin, like you're going to have a hard time hiding your, your $10 billion in that $5 billion, obviously, like it's a higher number. Um, so smaller amounts, easier attainable privacy. But I think as a, as a goal of Bitcoiners should be relatively accessible financial privacy when using Bitcoin, because you never know when your individual government might not be my government, might not be safe's government, but when your individual government decides that you're a criminal and they want to take your Bitcoin, they want to pressure you and your family, they want to track your, your transactions, we should have tools available to them to, to make it easier for them to use Bitcoin privately. That is basically my frame. Well, yeah. And again, we're going back to the same kind of discussion that I have had with Giacomo, which is, uh, I, I agree on this being a goal. But again, uh, the question is now, let's take out the criminal. Let's say a political dissident that, that you actually like. Uh, do you feel comfortable enough telling them to hide their tracks from their government on Bitcoin? This is, um, I'd like it to be there. But I think, you know, realistically, that's my frustration. I agree with you. Yeah. I, like My frustration is I spend 45 minutes with them and I barely scratch the surface on what they need to keep in mind when trying to use Bitcoin in an adversarial environment like that. And like I, I mean, and, and you're you're much more technically qualified than me, so I, I would not be able to spend the 45 minutes of doing as good of a job as you would. But I think that there is an element of, you know, first do no harm, which you need to keep in mind. and. Um, I wonder whether uh, you might actually be making it more likely that they get caught if they think that they are able to use Bitcoin privately. I think perhaps there is a little bit of um, overselling the case. And I, and, and, and I was being a little bit provocative with Giacomo, uh, but maybe, 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 you know, oh, that's rare. Yeah. But I mean, like maybe, <laughs> maybe, maybe this is, maybe this is the new coffee. You know, there was a time when we all wanted, the, we, we all thought nah. on-chain transactions are the free coffee, but like maybe privacy is just not as attainable for the vast majority of users. I mean, I think I can see, you know, why, if you've had an old stash that you uh, had for a long time with no KYC, it's easier for you to hide your tracks, but like, you know, you're talking to a political dissident in somewhere and you're telling them, Hey, you know, use this. No, I think it's the opposite case. I, I think, I think the coffee transactions that Bitcoin is great for, for low fee instant transactions on chain selling point was obviously bullshit and trade-offs weren't disclosed properly. I think at the same time, early Bitcoin, we saw a lot of people saying it was anonymous internet money with no trade-offs that you just didn't have to worry about it and you could just use it. A lot of people are in jail because of that. Right. And one, and the reason is, is because they were making mistakes because they weren't aware of the trade-offs. And I think uh, we've seen a lot of productive conversation around using Bitcoin privately more recently over the last three years or so, where most privacy advocates in Bitcoin are very clear with the trade-offs. If anything, to a fault. Like I get, I get on all the time about fudding Bitcoin, creating fear, uncertainty, doubt, and 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 talking shit about Bitcoin. And people accuse me of of pushing people into shit coins or pushing people out of Bitcoin and stuff. Like I'm one of the most bullish Bitcoin people ever. But I feel compelled that when I talk about using Bitcoin privately to explain all the trade-offs and explain all the risks. And I think most people in the Bitcoin privacy community are pretty good about that. And I would just say that if our goal here is creating a money that's independent of corporations and states and, you know, is, is immune to that kind of pressure that is truly censorship resistant, we should not be tied to our Bitcoin balances. Our real life identity should not be tied to our, our legal names, should not be tied to our, our Bitcoin balances. And the question is, it's like, okay, 
So we can go through a million different scenarios about how a sophisticated state would attack Bitcoin. But if we can't, if we can't stop, you know, the U.S. government from just sending every American a, either a letter saying, you know, we're taking your Bitcoin and if you don't give it to us, we're throwing you in jail or a letter saying we're going to humbly take 70 percent of your Bitcoin because of this new syntax we passed because you guys are causing inflation. Then what the fuck are we doing here? Like that is like we, we talk about cold storage, talk about using your no, we talk about all this other stuff. Well, the low hanging fruit for a state to take your Bitcoin is to just know how much Bitcoin you have and be like, you are going to jail unless you give us this much Bitcoin. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, I, th I think that is a realistic uh, and possible attack scenario we should um, be prepared for. Obviously, it's not something that is uh, that we would enjoy, but I think um, it, it might be the uh, it might be the bargain that we need to strike with the fiat world in order to, uh, you know, if Bitcoin keeps going up, I can see with almost certainty, at least some governments are going to do this, there's going to come a point in some country, I've said this before, there will come a point at which the Bitcoin that exists on the uh, Bitcoin exchanges is more valuable than the foreign currency reserves that exist in that country's central bank. And at that point, it's there's a switch that's going to flick in the head of the president or the prime minister or the um, uh, whoever's in charge of the country, which is, hang on a second, we've only got $2 billion of US dollars left in our bank but there's eight billion dollars of Bitcoin in all of these crypto exchanges, um, and and I think you know that's why uh, keeping your Bitcoin on uh, that's why I've said this many times. Only keep on exchanges the Bitcoin you're comfortable giving to your government. I think that's really going to be the low hanging fruit. Once one government sees that, that hey, hang on a second, we could triple our foreign reserves uh, assets by just taking half of the money from these uh, Bitcoin exchanges. I think it's going to happen, and that's why I think you know um, this is this is one of the other things to keep in mind to go back to our original discussion on self custody. You know, that's one of the many risks involved with having it in an exchange. One day your president wakes up and says Bitcoin is causing global warming and inflation and um, killing uh, the baby seals, and therefore we need to take seventy percent of your Bitcoin so that we can cause inflation <laughs> and kill baby seals with you. So uh, bear that in mind in your uh, scenarios. No, I agree with you. I just think I, I 100 percent agree that uh, we're going to see a lot of sovereign rug pulls where they're going to go in and 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 just basically we we've seen them do it to people's bank accounts already, um, and it's just going to be more of that. But I would just say you know, if if you know you should absolutely self custody, uh, it's a significant improvement, like not even close to. To holding it with a regulated third party in terms of state resistance but if you just if you just buy on coinbase connect it to your identity and then send it one hop out to your ledger wallet or cold card or whatever you're using for cold storage um, and take no kind of privacy precautions whatsoever is enforcement to steal that money more difficult than clicking a button and taking it from an exchange yes is it that much more difficult like no it's not that much more difficult they just they just they, they pressure what they what I see happening is you pressure a couple big guys. You, you do kind of what happened with Torrance. You pressure a couple big guys. You make an example out of them. Uh, Ninety percent of people comply. You know, they didn't have to go. They didn't have to go store to store to close people's businesses down during covid. They told people that they were going to get fined if they kept them open. And a couple of people didn't listen to them that were big businesses and they went to those businesses and they made a huge example of them and 95% of people complied and they closed their small business. Yeah, but I mean, I think um, I, I, I'm not saying that they won't do it, but I think, you know, in terms of the laws and traditions of particularly Western democracies, you know, for all of the problems that we have about them, I think the concept of property rights is still one of those things that has not been completely eradicated. So um, the money that's in the bank, you know, it's all fake uh, money and it's all made up. And the idea that the government is just going to confiscate the reserves at the banks has already happened in 1934. And until today, you know, here we are almost 90 years later, the vast majority of Americans don't know that it happened or don't understand its significance. And they just think it was, oh, 
you know, somebody did something with the back end of our monetary system where they decided they were just going to, you know, change the way that they handled gold. But anyways, I don't understand that. But really what it was is that they took away about 40% of society's gold. And the government confiscated 40% of the society's gold by revaluing it and taking all the gold that was in the banks <clears throat> and giving people papers. Could they have gotten away with that if they had gone door to door having to take the gold from everybody's house and also knowing that the gold was digital, meaning that it could be hidden in people's skulls or it could be, um, you know, it could be, it's much easier to hide. I think the, the politics of um, door to door confiscation is much, much, much more complicated than just, you know, getting a bunch of idiots on TV, a bunch of Keynesians on TV who say, oh, we figured out that we're going to fix your, you know, all of the problems, we figured out the solution. The solution is we're just going to have to take money from the banks. Don't bother. You're still going to have more dollars. <laughs> well, I mean, look, that's why I think enforcement is you make an example out of few people and most people comply. Um, I, once again, you know, the Bitcoin ledger is forever, right? Um, first of all, as you, I, you just mentioned, we had executive order 6102 in America. Uh, the people that weren't on lists of gold owners were not affected. The people that were listed as gold owners were known to be committing what I, I think it was a felony at the time, um, but committing whatever crime they decided you were committing. People that had in the bank obviously just immediately got a haircut. So there's different layers there, right? Everything has trade-offs. There's different risk balance. People should keep that in mind. But then the second precedent we have is we actually in America, I'm an American. I'm sure a lot of your listeners are an American, are Americans. And it's probably pretty similar in their current uh, co uh, country as well. If we enter a hyperinflationary period today, the way our tax system is set up in America is our top end cap gains rate is between 30 to 40%, depending which state you live in. Okay. If we enter a hyperinflationary period and 100% of your wealth is in Bitcoin, then you are a criminal unless you give the government 40% of your Bitcoin. But literally, no rules need to change. So that is the current status quo of American Bitcoin policy, in my opinion. Right is 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 nearly half of your Bitcoin will be seized from you under threat of violence. You will get thrown in jail if you don't pay your taxes. I'm saying everyone should pay their taxes. I'm not telling people they shouldn't pay the taxes, but that's the current status quo as it is today. And that gets very malicious in a hyperinflationary environment. Absolutely. And worth remembering here, you know, the current $10,000 reporting threshold, you need to report for any kind of uh, transaction that's more than $10,000. This was, of course, started like everything bad in 1971. And back then, $10,000 was in uh, real terms much more than today, probably more like 100, more than $100,000. But, you know, as the money devalues, the $10,000 just becomes less and less. And so you go from $10,000 at that time could buy you a house. So they were asking you to report for transactions that are buying houses. And that seems like a reasonable thing. You know, you tell people, look, you know, we, if there's, a, a, you know, a Soviet spy who's buying property in uh, Ohio to build a, a Soviet base here, you know, we, we'd need to find out, you know, we'd, we'd want to just make sure that all the all big transactions for all the houses aren't being sourced from some Soviet spy. Then, then we find that, you know, one big giant town in Ohio is a, a Soviet, uh, Soviet hotbed. So, you know, it seems reasonable. You could say $10,000 is a reasonable thing. But then, of course, you devalue the dollar. And now $10,000 is uh, can't buy you a lot. And so now, you know, it's less than uh, the average car is $10,000 uh, $10, is less than the average car. So you still have to report that. And of course, it's only going to get worth and less and less and less. It's true. It is. It is. A, it's a terrible thing. But uh, I think my my uh, perhaps my uh, my difference is that I think the real prize here and the thing that I'm focused on and the thing that is going to fix all of those things more than all of these um, uh, individual kind of wins that we could achieve by Bitcoin, the real prize is ending central banking. That's the jackpot. And if we can do that, then I think that's where you're really going to be winning the war of privacy by putting uh, governments that spy on people out of business and by taking um, basically anybody who um, uses part of their government's business model as spying on their citizens 
is going to be bankrupted because you can't print money. And if you waste your money on stupid bullshit, you don't do it. You know, this is why in the 19th century, they didn't have a war on drugs. They didn't have such a very powerful nanny state that tried to control every aspect of people's lives as we do now, because they didn't have enough money to do that because they needed to tax people. They needed to make gold. They couldn't print gold. Now they can print dollars so they can do all of this crazy stuff. So for me, I think uh, the, 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 real, uh, the, real, the real prize that we need to focus on is, I mean, I'm not saying that all of that stuff obviously doesn't matter, but I'm saying what really matters ultimately is if we can put the money printers of the central banks out of business. And if that means uh, paying 40% of your Bitcoin to Caesar to set us free, I think that's a price where much worth paying. You know, you should stack harder and stay humble more so you can afford <laughs> to pay, uh, you know, set yourself free, buy your own slavery, but buy your own, uh, what does they call it when a slave buys themselves out of slavery? We might end up doing that, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm obviously no fan of taxation, but uh, that might be the case. I wonder, like, so first of all, like, I'm pretty confident that we're going to obsolete central banks. I mean, I just don't know why someone would want to use money controlled by a corporation or a government when you have an option to use a better money that isn't. Um, so I'm pretty sure we're going to do that. I think what happens in that situation, and it's not just because Bitcoin exists. I mean, I, I think this this house of cards that has been built up is just been primed to fail magnificently at some point. The question is when that happens. But as that's happening is, is there's like this theory, dollar milkshake theory that I prescribe to that I think we're seeing in real time right now, which is this idea that dollar is the reserve currency of the world. Um, so as a result, as, as we're kind of entering our inflationary uh, spiral, death spiral, uh, so to speak, uh, these other currencies basically hit that first uh, as people flood into dollars. And, and as Americans, we have this benefit that there's, there's this, this delayed situation where our dollar, is in, you know, our dollar is, is increasing in value compared to these other currencies that are considered inferior. Um, but as a result, is we're basically seeing these states fail in real time. And then ultimately, the last state to fail will be America. And so these states have increasingly high debt loads. Uh, they've been used to just printing money. They've been used to doing the silent inflation tax, uh, which disproportionately affects poor people and they do not even fucking realize. It's almost like a wealth distribution from poor to rich in that, in that scheme. As these countries start to flail and get more desperate, like there's the tax rates are going to go up. Like they're going to, the, 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 play, the play is, okay, we need more revenue and we're desperate. What do those desperate governments do at that point? And hopefully, you know, my government doesn't do it. Hopefully your government doesn't do it. Hopefully everyone who's listening's government doesn't do it. But I think it's prudent for us to be prepared for a situation where governments turn on their own people, which they already have in a lot of ways and try and extract as much value out of them as possible during that failure period. So I would say uh, to think that cap gains, capital gains on Bitcoin will not increase in that failing state situation is incredibly naive. Like I think uh, it will be extreme small. Once again, I'll go back to the, to, to the response to COVID globally. Small business owners are the single most popular category of businesses in america and i'm pretty sure that's true globally and they shut down those businesses and ruined their livelihoods and no one fucking blinked an eye if you don't think that in a failed state scenario they aren't going to be easily able to rally up people to be against bitcoiners and to treat us as a a a cow that needs to be butchered or a cow that needs to be milked as a as much of revenue as possible out of us, um, then I think we're playing a different game. Like, I think that's the scenario that we should be prepared for. Hope that doesn't happen. If that doesn't happen, then great. But expect it, prepare for it, reduce the pain as much as possible when it does happen. Yeah, that's a very good way of, uh, of putting it. So um, getting back to uh, privacy, tell us a little bit about what your thoughts are on um, what tools to use for privacy. I know this is a, 
highly contentious uh, topic and people are always getting angry at each other on Twitter. And I must say, I don't have strong opinions um, um, and I don't understand the debate very well. So, uh, is the, I mean, if you want to skip it, we can skip it. <laughs> Just I mean, look, it, first but... of all, I'll say I'm I'm. I don't care which tools you use. The number one thing I want people to do is be aware that there are privacy risks in using Bitcoin. Be aware that we're leaking all this information when we're using Bitcoin. And we're just leaking all this information on the internet in general. So, I mean, I before the Bitcoin privacy conversation even comes up, you know, why do you have an Amazon Alexa in your house? Like, wh why do you have a Google Voice in your house? Like, why, why, why did you pay a corporation to install a wiretap in your home? You know, why are you letting Google scan all of your emails? Um, why do you have a camera on the front of your house that's sending every single footage that happens in front of your house and every time you enter and exit your house to Amazon servers that are then shared and stored insecurely? Try and reduce, be aware of the privacy information you're leaking. Try and reduce that information as possible. Don't send your DNA to a to to a to a corporation that is is then going to send all that information to china and the u.s government and dox all your grandkids um like consider not doing that consider making small improvements to your digital privacy situation um and any any time someone considers doing that or starts being more aware of the amount of privacy information like private information they're leaking that is a win in my book. That is a massive win. Most people are just being very naive about this stuff. I just want you guys to be aware and to start paying attention to it. Now, on the Bitcoin privacy tool landscape, specifically collaborative transactions, there's three tools. There's Join Market, there's Whirlpool, which you can use with Samurai Wallet and Sparrow Wallet, and there's other wallets that are going to integrate Whirlpool in the future, and there's Wasabi. They all offer collaborative transactions. Um, join market is the most censorship resistant. It doesn't rely on a centralized coordination server. Um, so if we have a full blown state attack, which some people are kind of speculating because, uh, Ethereum privacy tools got put on sanction list, uh, uh Ethereum privacy tool got put on the sanction list yesterday. Um, join market is in the trade off balance, trying to be the most censorship resistant, uh, robust system that 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 exists today um, and then you have whirlpool and wasabi which both operate under the centralized coordinator scheme where there's a centralized server that can't break your privacy um, but is required to basically construct that collaborative transaction both those protocols are a bit different um, personally i prefer the whirlpool protocol but based on the trade-offs they make this is a very deep conversation uh my show, Citadel Dispatch, we go deep on this almost on a weekly basis. There's hundreds of hours of free content available there. So if you guys are interested in, in, in digging in deep, uh, I would recommend that. Specifically, there's an episode 43 where I go with this guy, Bitcoin Q&A, and we just go from start to finish, you know, Bitcoin privacy, onboarding Bitcoin privacy. We call it Bitcoin for Beginners. I think it's useful for beginners and more advanced users. We try and make it very actionable. And um, but yeah, but my my key my key takeaway here is I'm not going to tell you which tools to use. I'm done with all this bullshit drama. What I what I, I I'm not really done with the bullshit drama. My 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 love of the Bitcoin space is that as many people hate me as possible. That then I know I'm talking about the right things. Um, but. Uh, I just want you guys to be aware that we are leaking a lot of private data, myself included. Try and reduce that. Try and improve your situation. Our kids are counting on us. Our grandkids are counting on us. Agreed. Agreed. Yes. All right. Let's see. Uh, David's got a question. David? Yeah. <clears throat> Matt and, and Safe. <clears throat> you have uh, discussed for a bit the, um, the trade-offs uh, regarding privacy that Bitcoin transactions have. I have like a two parts question. Uh, first part is maybe you can also comment how this applies to lightning transactions. Because my understanding is that they are somehow more private than on than on chain transactions. But I don't understand from a technical point of view how much more private 
they are and how high they rate in the privacy scale of not being the lowest hanging fruit. Yeah, I mean, so this is a very, uh, unfort- uh, lightning is very early. It's very new. Um, I think there is a, you know, we talk about incentives in Bitcoin a lot. There's an incentive for influencers, public people in the space to hype it up as much as possible and make it seem like there's there's not, there's minimal trade-offs or there's no risk, uh, um, that it doesn't require personal responsibility and education. Obviously, like everything else, that's not the case. Um, right now on the privacy side, uh, all else equal, uh, if you're sending a transaction on Lightning, uh, you should have better privacy than if you're sending it on chain. Um, that's because if I'm receiving your Lightning payment uh, and I'm not a sophisticated actor, it's more difficult for me to figure out which Bitcoin was used to, to spend that, which on-chain Bitcoin was used to spend that, what UTXO was used to fund that transaction. Uh, um, there are active attacks you can do on Lightning. I mean, I spent like three hours on episode 21 of Sil Dispatch going through like the different Lightning privacy nuances. But the key thing here to take away is that as it currently stands, and there's a lot of work being done that hopefully will not make this the case, senders on Lightning have significantly more privacy than receivers on Lightning. So if you're running a store and you're, you need to receive Lightning payments and you have this always on node, um, those payments, you should operate under the assumption that those payments can be linked. Um, if you're making a transaction that you are concerned about in an adversarial environment, and a perfect example would be, I think, the Canadian truckers. So the Canadian Freedom Convoy had a fundraiser and you could donate via on-chain bitcoin or via lightning Um, in that situation we saw trudeau and the canadian government come out really strongly against that fundraising attempt and they actually went after donors as well as the recipients and you were strictly better off if you donated via lightning there than if you donated via on-chain because on-chain has the clear on-chain history and in lightning if you're trying to uh, de-anonymize or attack the privacy of the sender on a lightning transaction, it's a it's more of an active attack. You're running lightning nodes. And when we talk about incentives, that's actually a really cool incentive because basically what that means is these surveillance companies and governments have to lock up a bunch of Bitcoin on lightning and run lightning nodes and actually provide routing for the community uh, if they want to try and de-anonymize the senders more, more times than not. So if you're just, you know, uh, opening up a lightning node not to receive payments just to send payments strictly a privacy improvement uh and it is promising on that side and i would just add here that there is a project that i've been talking a lot about lately called fediment which is this open source project that attempts to combine something called chami and ecash uh, which is a um a legacy privacy cryptography tool uh created by david chom Uh, to create a lightning wallet that you can just install on your phone. Uh, It is custodial, but it's a federation of custodians. So the idea is you have these multi-sig custodians. Uh, Instead of a single sig custodian, maybe you have eight eight of 10 need to collude together to take your money and you have privacy from the custodians. So when you make a lightning payment out of there, uh, those custodians and external actors, if there's a thousand people in that Fediment wallet, they don't know which of those a thousand are spending. I would say, I mean, just to go back to our earlier privacy tools conversation, it's the single most bullish privacy tool uh, because it's just so accessible to the average user. Uh, and, And one thing I've noticed in my years of education in this space is that most people will choose the most convenient option. So Fediments are pretty cool because it's, uh, it basically, improves the status quo and the most convenient option becomes private by default um, and easily interoperable with the rest of the lightning network. Uh, Excellent. Uh, Dorian. Thanks Matt for this uh, green intel. I have read uh, a lot of your articles in privacy. It's uh, really, really uh, good, uh, good writings. Uh, so I have a question about the decentralized exchanges, uh, more specifically a BISC uh, software. 
do you think that that could be a significant player in the near future? Like, do you use When we talk about trade-off balance, BISC is attempting to be on the extreme censorship resistance side at the expense of convenience. Um, all users of BISC run their own BISC node, uh, run their own Bitcoin node. Uh, it's attempting to be as censorship resistant as possible. And the result is uh, it's not very convenient to use. Um, so what I'm looking at is Ideally, we have more convenient P2P trading options um, that don't require identification information. Um, one example of that so far is HODL HODL uh, that doesn't do KYC. They don't go as far on the trade-off balance in the censorship resistant angle as BISC uh, because they, a company based in Latvia, are holding one of the keys, but they can't steal your money. Right. They can't they can't steal your money. So there's a situation where HODL HODL gets pressured by by their government and they have to shut down. But in, up until this point, they haven't had to. Uh, we have another service called RoboSats, which you can access in a Tor browser um, that is making a similar trade off model, model as HODL HODL. But instead, the developers are are anonymous or they're NIMS. Um, so it's harder to put pressure on them. That might not exist in a couple of years, right? Like BISC is designed almost like Bitcoin's designed, right? Like they designed it to try and be as robust and censorship resistant as possible. But I think I'm most bullish on the tools that take a step a little bit more to the convenience side, like HODL, HODL and RoboSats. And there's another one coming out uh, that's in stealth that's mobile first. Um, and I, I think there's a very strong argument uh, that if we have like a, a very convenient mobile first app that you just open the app um, and there is a centralized company behind it, but they're not taking custody of your funds, um, that most governments will probably let that slide. And if they let that slide, then that's kind of like ideal trade off balance. And then if they get crushed, uh, then people will move over to BISC. All right, great. Um, we've got another question from uh, Scott on what uh, I wanted to ask you this question as well. Um, running a node, how do you recommend going about that? What are your thoughts on running a node? So, I mean, the easiest way to run a node is to just install something called Bitcoin Core, which is an application on your computer. Sparrow has this functionality, as I was talking about Sparrow Wallet earlier, that you can use with your hardware wallet, where you can actually just run Bitcoin Core on your computer. Uh, you can run Sparrow on your computer. And if you're running both apps at the same time, you're using your own node and you're able to interact with your hardware wallet. It's super simple. Um, that is probably the, the, the easiest way for someone to do it. There's another piece of software called Spectre Wallet. Same thing. Run Bitcoin Core. I think Spectre Wallet actually takes it a step further because if you install Spectre Wallet, there's actually an option you can check that's like also install Bitcoin Core. And then you don't have to actually click run on two applications. You can just open Spectre, and then when you open Spectre, it'll automatically run your Bitcoin node at the same time. Reminder, when you're using the Bitcoin network, uh, you have to use a Bitcoin node to interact with the network. And if you're not using your own node, you're trusting uh, a corporation or a single individual um, with both your privacy and them actually validating the rules of the network that gives Bitcoin's value in the first place. Um, so you want to try to use your own node or at least use a friends or family node. Um, other options include things like Raspi Blitz, um, Ronin Dojo, uh, Umbral. Like these tools basically allow you to take a, uh, a cheap single use computer and you can turn it into a 24 seven Bitcoin node. And what's nice about that is it makes it easier to connect to mobile wallets and stuff like that. Cause you're just like running it in your closet. Um, you just scan a QR code, connect it to, to your mobile wallet to use it on your phone. And that's nice too, because you can have friends and family use it, right? So I have uh, multiple 24 seven nodes that I run. Um, and then my friends and family, like their first step can be using my node and they're, they're trusting me with their privacy and valid validity of the rules, but I can't steal their money. Excellent. Uh, what about inheritance? How do you get your coins to your grandkids? If you don't trust, uh, if you don't want to trust others. 
inheritance is a tricky situation that we haven't solved in any straightforward way. Um, so when Safe gave me the warm intro, one of the projects that I have available is something called finalmessage.io. Um, and that was like kind of a simple tool to take a stab at the inheritance thing because so I used to uh, I used to live in New York before I got out of there. And I used to commute to work on uh, an electric longboard that would go like 20 miles an hour through some of the most ridiculous traffic in the world. Um, and 2017, like the Bitcoin price was rising. And I realized like if I hit my head, uh, we live in a world of personal responsibility now post Bitcoin and <laughs> the Bitcoin would be gone. No one would be able to get that Bitcoin. Um, so final message is this idea of a dead man switch where you, you do trust the service uh, to actually send the message, but the message is encrypted. So you don't trust them, trust us with the contents of the message, just that we actually send it. Um, but there's multiple methods here. I think multi-sig makes this a lot easier. A final message was designed with multi-sig in mind where you could put one key in there. So even if the encryption fails, uh, that one key does not spend your funds. Uh, but you can work through in your head multi-sig scenarios um, where like a lawyer has one key, uh, your, your spouse has one key, and then you have, and then maybe someone else has another key. You want to, you want to do it in a way that the threshold, that those entities can't spend it. Um, they can't spend it on their own, but together they can spend it basically uh, is kind of the scenario that you work out. And if you want to do it in a single SIG way, you know, there's something called a passphrase, which basically when you talk about single SIG, uh, you have your secret backup words. They're either 12 or 24 words. The passphrase is the 13th or the 25th word that you make up yourself and you need both parts together in order to spend the funds. Um, figuring out a way to get that last part to someone if you die um, a lot of this requires some level of creativity, thinking through your threat model, um, thinking through what kind of risks you're trying to avoid. Um, I will say, just keep in mind that if you give someone full access to your Bitcoin, that doesn't, you know, that you haven't thought through a way to make sure they can't spend it while you're still alive, not only are you trusting them not to steal your money, uh, which I think most of us like there should be at least some reasonable level of trust with the people that you plan to leave your bitcoin to that they're not going to take your money they become a threat attack as as itself so uh i i like my favorite example is like my mom for instance right like if i told my mom how to access my bitcoin like she'd probably put on a post-it note on a computer right and just right on the screen just throw it right on the screen there so she doesn't even want to steal my money, but she would be a attack vector for the family's Bitcoin holdings. So you have to kind of think these things through and hopefully we have better solutions, uh, particularly on the multi-sig front uh, in the near future. But right now, the unfortunate reality is there's no real clean, clean answer. You kind of have to work these things out yourself. Yeah, uh, it's uh, <laughs> with so many questions with Bitcoin, it's that way, you know, you, you first get the question and then you start thinking about it and then it's just, you realize there's so many layers to it and this so it's just an endless uh, rabbit hole which is why you love yeah. it <laughs> i mean just to be clear here like just to frame the perspective a little bit i mean i've been thinking about this since like 2017 so it's been five years now um and if i was going to run it in my head i mean uh safe like likes earthquake so if there was an earthquake here right now and i just got swallowed by the earth hole there's probably like a 90 percent chance that my bitcoin's gone like I don't, I'm not that confident in, <laughs> because I picked my trade-off balance that I wanted it to be as resistant to theft as possible. And as a result, as you enter other people into that scenario, uh, you're making it more vulnerable. I see. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, there are no, there are no things that have no trade-off. That's one of the powerful things that economics teaches you. Everything has an opportunity cost. And um something also that engineering teaches you uh, you know you you can't have the most uh, luxurious car perform as well as the lamborghini you got to choose you can either have the rolls royce or the lamborghini you're not going to be able to get um 
the best performance out of the yeah you know, you're not going to be able to sit relaxed in a rolls royce and get the performance of the lamborghini it just doesn't work uh, i'm sure some people someone is going to write in and say their car can do that but maybe <laughs> but generally most of us no mortal people have uh, trade-offs to deal with so uh yeah and then there's another question from david yeah thank you very much uh first of all for the answer to my other lightning question this one is also around lighting um, my question is if, uh, in case, um, an individual is running a node with a fair amount of channels and transactions being routed through it every day, um, if there is any way to use this in a smart way to also achieve some level of, um, anonymity in your, that is to some extent close to what the coin join can, can produce. Um, what I mean is when you, to my understanding, when you do a cooperative transaction or a coin join, you may achieve a high level of privacy, but it's very obvious you have done this to anyone uh, that tracks you. They may not know where it went out, but it, they, it's very obvious it went in. Um, whereas with Lightning, uh, I was wondering if, for example, by uh, opening a, a big or not so big Lightning channel with this Bitcoin you have on chain, and then either looping out these funds or just transferring them through a rebalance to another of your channels and then closing that other channel, then effectively a near to identical amount of Bitcoin comes back to your on-chain wallet. But in terms of the UTXOs, that got completely shuffled because it's it's a it's another multi-seek that got uh, closed by closing the channel that is not when it No, yeah, I follow David. Uh, I mean, look, there's something there. Uh, if you do it perfectly, you will achieve pretty strong privacy. Um, just to go back to the Bitfinex hacker, like it usually comes down to some mistake someone made. So, like when we talk about these processes, you want to have um, the most simple process as possible. So there's, it's less likely for people to shoot themselves in the foot. And there, there are people working on, there's, there's two wallets in development right now, one called Vortex um, and one, at least last time I heard called Private Lightning Wallet. I think they're changing the name now. Um, that attempt to kind of automate those kind of situations and, and do it in a, in a way that preserves privacy best practices and, and, and does it default. So like you don't have these areas where you can shoot yourself in the foot. I would say the one key thing though, is if you're talking about using lightning privately, um, it usually is, is, is you, you, you want to have, you want to have many nodes that you're constantly basically deleting and starting new nodes over and over again. So on the routing node side, like if you have one node with a lot of large channels, um, you kind of have to just assume, you have to kind of operate under the assumption that that, that node is, is completely fucked from a privacy perspective, pardon my language. Uh, but uh, you can use that hand in hand with other nodes that you spin up, right? So you can have you know, a node that you spin up and you use it for a month or so and then but it's connected back to your your main routing node through a through a large lightning channel um and then you get rid of that node and you open up a new node um but i i would i would i would say uh yeah i i would say if 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 privacy is your goal when using lightning essentially you're you're sending the nodes you're using to send transactions should be different than the nodes you're using for routing transactions your main constant routing node that's going to last there for years uh, is probably like an easy rubric to think of in your head. But once again, lightning is so new. Like one of the issues I have with lightning is it is such a clear privacy improvement for Bitcoin because your transactions just aren't on chain, right? Like you have your lightning open and your lightning closed transaction at its core. What lightning is, is, is a protocol for collaborative Bitcoin transactions, right? Because you're locking up this Bitcoin into a lightning channel, essentially into a two of two multi-sig, and you're able to make thousands of payments off of this one on-chain transaction. So as a result, you don't have that transaction graph on the on-chain ledger, on this ledger that lasts forever. So it's it's it strictly improves a privacy situation on Bitcoin, 
because you're not recording all those transactions down to this forever ledger. But there's so many different nuances and areas where you can shoot yourself in the foot that as Safe said earlier, particularly when I talk to activists, like I'm very, very careful about talking about Lightning as a privacy tool because there's just so many areas where you can screw yourself. And if you have a relatively sophisticated actor, they can use that to unwind your transactions. So um, it's a hell of a rabbit hole, Lightning privacy. As I said, we did talk about it at length on Silla Dispatch multiple times. Uh, particularly episode 21, three hours. It was like three hours of lightning foot gun situations. Um, but it is it is definitely a privacy tool to keep in mind. And I would say that um, talking about Bitcoin narratives, uh, as we talked about earlier, uh, being safe, um, about like coffee transactions, stuff like that. Uh, I'm more... A previous Bitcoin narrative we had was merchant adoption matters a shit ton in like 2013 to 2015, and it completely fell on its head. And I think part of the reason was uh, that the merchant processors were like BitPay. They were, they were these centralized processors uh, that were immediately converting it to fiat and were fully KYC'd. And those processors were on-chain Bitcoin. And when you pay a merchant with on-chain Bitcoin, you're essentially handing them this massive liability of data, of private data, this transaction history on the UTXO. And one of the reasons I'm bullish on the merchant adoption narrative of today is, first of all, we're later in the Bitcoin adoption cycle. So it's more realistic that people will actually want to spend Bitcoin um, because they're earning Bitcoin or the majority of their savings is in Bitcoin. Um, but the second thing is these merchant processors tend to go lightning only. So if you go to an IBEX terminal, and you buy a taco in Miami at, with an Ibex terminal, and you pay them with Lightning, um, unless they use sophisticated attacks, it is hard for that for Ibex or that merchant to tell which UTXO funded that transaction. All of a sudden, they don't have all that additional data liability. The spender doesn't have all this mental headache of, am I leaking all this information to the merchant? Um, and it just reduces it reduces that friction significantly. All right. Well, this has uh, been going on for uh, quite a while now. We've had you for quite a bit. Really appreciate your time, Matt. This has been a tour de force. I think a lot of people will benefit from this because we don't usually discuss those things, and it's opened up a lot of uh, a lot of doors and rabbit holes for future discussions. Hopefully, we'll have you on again, and we'll get uh, uh, more and more people to discuss all of those things and. Uh, find more ways to inform and confuse people and get them hooked on listening to more <laughs> podcasts. So they need to stay more informed. <laughs> Thank it you so much. It was my pleasure. It was my pleasure. And thanks for having me safe. I look forward to kicking it again with you in person pretty soon. Yeah. Likewise. Take care, man. Cheers. Cheers.